Members, if you'd take your seats and uh, focus your attention on the agenda today, we'll get started here. Thank you for uh, your indulgence. I know we're a couple minutes late. Once again, if you'd set your phasers to stun, I'd appreciate it. Um, and the uh, committee administrator will note the roll. The minutes are in front of you. Members, if someone would like to move approval of the minutes, uh, the chair. Chairman, I move the, min min the minutes of uh, uh, Wednesday, March 7th. Representative Benson, that's you. Yes. Discussion to those minutes. <coughs> the amendments. Seeing none, let's vote. All in favor, signify by aye. 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 Opposed. Motion prevails. The minutes are approved. <coughs> the first bill on the uh, agenda for the day is um, Representative Poppy's bill. I'm looking to see if Hop's here. At the moment, um, there we go, Representative Hoppy, um, and Representative Morrow. I guess either one of you could do this. Representative Hoppy, are you prepared to sit down and explain the bill? That would be House Bill 1670 regarding pupil transportation. Uh, Representative Morrow, would you move the bill to get it in front of us? Uh, Mr. Chair, I'll move uh, House Bill 1670 to be. To be moving on to another committee. Yeah. Yeah. yeah thank you. Just a moment. This is going to the general register. And in a moment, I'll move the A1 amendment when that's appropriate. Thank you. Um, yes, the bill is in front of us. And Representative Hoppy, would you rather have us amend the bill before you explain it or after? Uh, Mr. Chair, it's your discretion, whatever's easiest for you in the committee. Um, it's a technical amendment. The chair will exercise some discretion. Ask Representative Morrow to move the A1 amendment. Mr. Chair, I move the A1 amendment. Thank you. The A1 is amendment is in front of us. Members, questions, discussion? Seeing none, let's vote. All in favor, signify by aye. 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 The mo opposed, uh, the motion prevails. The A1 amendment is adopted. The bill is in the shape in which you wish to discuss it. Representative Hoppy, welcome to my committee. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Excuse nice me. To be welcome here. to the committee. I'm privileged to chair. That's a better way to say it. So. We all know what you meant, Mr. Chair. <laughs> thank you. Um, this is a bill that deals with alcohol and drug testing requirements for uh, Type 3 vehicles. Uh, or exp not vehicles, vehicle operators, and I have Mr. Kelleher to here to uh, explain in more detail uh, the bill. Mr. Kelleher, welcome to the committee. You know the drill, and would you explain a little bit about what this means for us? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. My name is Tom Kelleher. I'm here on behalf of the Minnesota School Bus Operators Association. Um, members in your packet, you should have a document that's covered, looks like this. Um, what we're talking about is the Type 3 vehicles, which is the second, the third from the bottom. Um, the law we're going to be talking about um, would mirror federal law and um, not have the Drug and Alcohol Testing in the Workplace Act of Minnesota statutes, um, 181.950 to 181.957, apply um, in regards to alcohol and drug substance abuse testing. I've included in the packet um, a letter from our lawyer that describes sort of why we have to do this. Also in the packet is the existing drug and alcohol testing in the workplace statute. That's the first eight pages. And then in the back of the packet are the two existing places in state statute that we're um, copying, borrowing, cloning the language from. So we're not inventing something new that for um, interstate carriers and motor carriers, they already have this exemption. And basically what the bill does is it just says that um, if the employer, that would be the people I'm representing, um, if the testing and 
that the testing under paragraph F follows the testing procedures set forth for the Transportation Workplace and Alcohol Testing Program and Federal Code, and I won't read all the rest of that. And what the amendment does is this um, changes one of the uh, references at the bottom. Someone must have transposed one. Um, but basically the gist of the bill um, says that uh, for Type 3 driver, drivers of Type 3 vehicles, um, the employers under DATWA, the state law um, of drug and alcohol testing in the workplace, that we'd have to offer um, someone who tested positive for substance abuse rehabilitation and an opportunity to be rehired. Um, that's some exposure that I think the um, school bus operators do not want to have um, for those types of buses since it's already exempt for types A, B, C, and D. Um, since we're transporting students, I think um, a first strike sort of policy for those um, testing positive for alcohol or substance abuse is what we'd like to have as a standard. And that's basically what the bill does. Questions for the testifier or about the bill? Mr. Members? Uh, Representative Biskins. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Kelleher, uh, would it still be possible for the employer to offer rehabilitation and rehire, or are we closing that door? Um, absolutely. Um, Kelleher. Mr. Chairman, Representative Biskins, um, basically, to my knowledge, we're not closing that opportunity. Um, this is a drug and alcohol workplace testing, the Drug and Alcohol Testing in the Workplace Act covers all employment opportunities and what we're trying to do is in for type 3 vehicle drivers they're transporting students we don't believe that that um, uh, requirement to um, offer rehab in some cases some people have described it as we would pay for the rehab and then offer, offer them an opportunity for um, a rehire as well. Representative Biscons follow-up. Thank you Mr. Chair. Representative Hoppe is that your understanding that it would provide more flexibility and not mandate on to the employer? Representative Hoppe? Mr. Chair, Representative Biskins, uh, yes, that is my understanding. Well, thank you for clarifying that because uh, we, we don't want them to have to, but nonetheless, those of us that are involved in second chance uh, ministries and so on are very concerned that they're able to if they wish. Representative Hoppe? Well, Mr. Chair um, and committee members and anybody in the crowd, if, that, if I'm wrong in that understanding, please let me know, and I'd be happy to uh, take a look at it and uh, tweak it somehow to make that the case. I haven't heard from anybody... Uh, that's opposed to the bill or anybody that had that concern, but uh, if there is anybody, we'll happily address it. Thank you for that offer. We appreciate and, it. Representative Biskin. And thank you, Mr. Chair and Representative Hoppe. Thank you for your commitment to look into that. Um, I'm not surprised that you wouldn't hear from anybody because um, yeah, almost politically incorrect you know, to offer a second chance to people, particularly when we're in the drivers. And I can understand that, but um, you know, uh, ab absolutely closing the door, I think, does, good har does harm to some good people who screw up every now and then. Representative Hoppe. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair and Representative Biskins, and I think that uh, you are in the driver's seat on this one. So, <laughs> Representative Morrow. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Chair, I'm looking at the April 20th letter from Thomas Revenue, which is the second page of the handout that Mr. Kelleher provided. In the third paragraph, the one beginning, employees and job applicants, members, if we look about eight lines down, there's a sentence, thus, as an example. Mm -hmm. School bus drivers who are covered under the U.S. Department of Transportation drug and alcohol testing rules are not subject to DATWA and can be terminated on a okay. first drug, positive drug or alcohol test. Representative Biscuits, I respect what you're saying. We certainly could confirm it. I read can be as being permissive as opposed to mandatory. Thank you for the observation, Representative Morrow. Further questions of this witness or the uh, bill author? Is there anyone else in the audience who would testify about this bill, for, against, or about? Sir? Uh, Mr. Chair, members of the committee, Brad Lundell, uh, today representing the Minnesota Association for Pupil Transportation. Uh, for those of our members that don't contract with Mr. Kelleher's client, we also uh, um, hire Type 3 drivers, and we're in support of this legislation as well. A lot of the school based employers that uh, uh, own their own fleets as opposed to contracting, and, and we agree uh, wholeheartedly with uh, the direction of the bill. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony, Mr. Lundell. Questions for Mr. Lundell? Seeing none, thank you. Anyone else would like to testify for about this bill? Seeing no one, uh, Representative Hoppe, thank you for bringing the bill forward. Representative Morrow, do you want to remove your motion to the General Register? I do. Thank you, Mr. Chair. <laughs> With that, members, as many as are in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? The motion prevails. The bill is on its way to the General Register. Thank you, Representative Hoppe. Thank you, Mr. Chair members.
Representative Myra in the room. And uh, Representative Myra, while she's coming, Ron, when you get a moment, would you close those inside doors? It's lunchtime, and sometimes we get a blast of noise coming in. Thanks. Representative Myra, House File 2032, and there's an A1 amendment. Will someone move this bill for Representative Myra? Representative Shemansky, would you do that? And this bill is going to uh, the Committee on Taxes. Thank you, Mr. Here. Chairman. So moved. Okay. Um, and Representative Myra, the A1 amendment, uh, is it sub substantive, uh, substantial in nature, or should, can we move it, put the bill in the shape you'd like? Would you put it in the Yes, we'll I do would that. Like. Representative Shemansky, would you move the A1 amendment? Uh, Mr. Chairman, I move the... Uh, House File 2032A1 Amendment. Good deal. Thank you. The members that's in front of us, discussion to it. Seeing none, let's vote. All in favor, signify by aye. 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 Opposed? Motion prevails. <coughs> Representative Myra, your bill is amended. Uh, House File 2032. Welcome yes. to the committee. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members. What this uh, bill does is it modifies the definition of retail sales for used car leases. There are only three states in the country that assess sales tax on used car leases. And Minnesota is the only one of the three that assesses it all up front. Basically what that does is it kills this line of business in our state. Uh, this bill was brought to me by a business in my house district, Northland Auto Enterprises. And uh, what this bill does is it, um, rather than having the sales ta taxes assessed at the beginning, it is assessed periodically over the term. The amendment, uh, rather than um, changing the flow of the funds, has the funds flowing in the same manner that they are currently. And so all that we're trying to do is change the timing on uh, when the uh, sales tax is assessed. There's four advantages to this bill. One is it will create more jobs in Minnesota as this line of business is opened up. Two, it will um, add revenues, as my uh, testifier will show in just a few moments. Three, it offers better transportation options for those who can least afford it. And four, it also, because of the requirements of the terms of the lease agreement, it will have, uh, we will have more people that are insured on the road. At this time, I would like uh, my testifier, Mr. Blowers, to explain the uh, flyer that is in your packet. Mr. Blowers? Welcome to the committee. If you'd identify yourself for the record and then proceed with your testimony, we'd appreciate that. Mr. Chairman, yes. My name is Dan Blower. I'm uh, Chief Operating Officer for Northland Auto Enterprises. Um, we um, uh, do a lot of leasing in uh, 47 states, so uh, Minnesota is just one of those. Um, if you, if I may uh, if direct your attention to the uh, uh, handout that we had uh, Something like this. Um, we had to in the in the top chart we picked a figure of 756 cars. That was a conservative estimate of the amount of cars we could add to the used car leasing pool in in uh, the first three years. Uh, maybe much higher than that. But just using that figure, um, the difference, uh, of course, today those cars get a. Uh, a, a fee of ten dollars per car if you're buying cars less than three thousand dollars <coughs> if you lease this car um, it's going to uh, require all of the sales tax up front uh, people can't afford that but if you defer it and allow it to be collected along with the lease payment you will find that uh, that that monthly tax is about twenty two dollars per month and it makes a huge difference at the end of the line. Uh, people who can't pay it all in one lump sum can very conveniently pay it uh, a month at a time. Uh, the bottom uh, chart, uh, we looked at the exact figures from Louisiana. They have 11,500 vehicles leased like this in Louisiana. Their actual income last year was 4,500,000. In Minnesota, if we use that same number of cars, we would collect $115,000. So it's it's a huge difference in tax for the state. And as the uh, um, paragraph in the middle indicates, it's good for the customers, it's good for the dealer, uh, it's good for jobs for Minnesota. There really is no downside. 
Thank you, Mr. Blarge, for your testimony. Members, are there questions for either the testifier or for uh, Representative Myra? Um, I'm assuming, Mr. Blowers, in looking at this example, that the example uh, is that there is no leasing. These are just purchased cars, and that's the, you're, so you're comparing people who actually lease in another state with people who can't lease here but just buy, and that's the revenue difference we're looking at, correct? Yes, Mr. Chairman. Uh, at the present time, there's less than 200 leased vehicles uh, of this type in Minnesota. Two. Okay, thank you for your comments. Further questions? Uh, members, I'm just going to ask, uh, just to point out, because I've had this discussion with Representative Myra previously, the uh, leased vehicle sales tax. Um, we do collect that on new car leases in this state. Uh, as I understand, the leased vehicle sales tax that would accrue should this become law would be dispensed or dispersed in the same fashion, 50% to the county state aid formula and 50% to rural transit, correct? Mr. Chair, that is correct. It would be the same as it is now. You know, I should probably look to my left and see if Representative, or Mr. Burris needs to correct me on that assumption. Is, is that a correct <laughs> assumption? Uh, Mr. Chair, yes, that is uh, correct. Great, thank Under you. Under the amended version. Thank you. Is there anyone else in the audience who would like to testify about this matter or against about seeing no one making any motion to come down? Thank you, Mr. Blasher, for your testimony. Or further questions? Before we renew our motion, Representative Schmansky, renew your motion to move this bill to taxes as amended. Mr. Chairman, I move the House File 2032 as amended uh, be recommended to pass and sent to taxes. Thank you. That's the motion. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? The motion, pre the motion prevails. The bill is on its way to taxes. Uh, thank Chair, you, Representative thank you. Myra. The next bill on the uh, agenda for today is House File 2328. This is uh, a bill that I'm authoring, air flight property tax levies, and uh, it's a bill we've been working on for a couple of years, members. This bill is also being referred to the tax committee, and so I will move House File 2328. Um, see if I have an amendment here. No. And uh, to get it in front of the committee, and then I'll move that it pass and be referred to the committee on taxes. Uh, to discuss or to testify to the bill, I have uh, two folks who would like to speak to it. Mr. Gordon Hoff, if you'd come down. And one other gentle, gentleman was going to speak to it. Good deal. Thanks. If you gentlemen would have a seat there, I'm going to describe the bill and the situation to the members of the committee and the audience, Mr. Hoff. And uh, then we'll, uh, uh, I'll let you speak to the bill if I may. Members, um, since the 1940s, Minnesota has had a Department of Aeronautics that has been, uh, at least for the last uh, many years, uh, the 10 years I've been here, no general fund money goes to the airport fund. It is self-generated uh, funds from flight line property tax, registration fees, and the aviation fuel tax that all the users of the system pay. Um, over the years, uh, this system has continued to generate about 18 to $19 million a year in total state generated revenue for the 136 publicly used airports in the state of Minnesota. Now that's not to say that the local, uh, localities that maybe own an airport also use some of their property tax on airport. That certainly happens. But from the state uh, airport fund perspective, all this money is uh, user fee generated money. Um, <clears throat> the uh, Along the way to some things that have happened is the fuel tax was first set in 1947, I believe it is and has never changed. It is among the lowest of the fuel taxes in all the 50 states at a nickel a gallon. The registration fees, on the other hand, because planes have become more expensive, the percentage has never changed, and it has become one of the most onerous registration systems in the nation. In an attempt to uh, get around this, because the effect of what happens is um, people quickly figure out that owning a plane and parking it in Minnesota can be a very expensive proposition. Taking the same plane to Wisconsin, for instance, I think has a cap of $5,000 per year on their registration fees. Having the uh, $60 million airplane sitting in Minnesota generates about a $600,000 a year registration for the same airplane sitting in the same kind of a hangar doing the same kind of work. Um, we could go on and on with the report that was done uh, four years ago when the Aviation Task Force actually looked at this. Nonetheless, the result of this work is this bill that you have in front of you. It uh, proposes to lower the registration fees to make them somewhat competitive with the states around us and raise the aviation fuel tax on jet fuel only 
by 10 cents a gallon to backfill the registration fees, uh, what the registration fee cut uh, would create to the airport fund. Now, I think there's a little more to it than that, but I think I'm going to take a break now, and I'm going to ask Mr. Gordon Hoff, who has been working with the Minnesota Business uh, Aviation Association for several years, to explain the effect of the bill. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. My name is Gordon Huff. I'm the Executive Director of the Minnesota Business Aviation Association. <laughs> In your packet, there should be several handouts uh, referring to uh, one that's uh, a bar graph. And if you look at the uh, one to the far left, there are three lines there, the blue being flight property tax, the red being aircraft registration, and the green being fuel. That was about 30 years after the law was enacted, and you can see how much fuel was how much registration was and, and the flight property tax. If you jump over to the third line or the third bar graph, you see that fuel and aircraft registration have changed dramatically there. And um, it continues to be much higher than the fuel. And uh, so uh, according to revenue uh, study in 08, on average we pay a half cent or we pay seven eighths of a cent on jet fuel because of a sliding, fa uh, a sliding amount it goes down to a half cent if you burn over 200,000 gallons in, in a year's time out of Minnesota. During that same period of time, <clears throat> there are two ch charts that show aircraft registration along with fuel and other items, but <clears throat> I draw your attention to one that starts with 1991. You'll see that aircraft registration at that time was $2 million. If you jump down to the second chart, and you look at 2010, you can see that flight line property tax was $6.2 million. And that's because the aircraft that our companies are purchasing now are so much more expensive. In the 1950s and 60s and 70s, you could buy a light twin and probably cover the territory that your company operated in. Today, that same company will need a 10 to $20 million jet probably to cover the same territory because it's going border to border, coast to coast, and in many cases going to Europe or the Far East. And so that aircraft needs to carry out the mission of the company as effectively and efficiently as it can. You know, one example, if you'll use Greater Minnesota, the town of Warroad, Minnesota, where Marvin Windows and Doors operates, is a town of 1,781 people. They employ 4,500 people in that one factory up there. And uh, they travel uh, coast to coast, and they go down to South America for uh, wood uh, transactions from time to time. They have about 10 aircraft takeoff and landings per day at that airport. Eight of them are by the Marvin Windows and Doors uh, aircraft uh, company owned. And they're flying down here to the cities to put people on the airlines and take customers back uh, to their shop up in uh, world Minnesota. And that's true of Polaris and Roseau. Uh, that's true of Schwann's in, in uh, Marshall, Minnesota. It's true of Hormel down in Austin. And you can use Fagan also in, in, uh, in uh, Granite Falls, Minnesota. So these companies are spread throughout the, the state and utilize their aircraft to compete uh, in, in the world uh, market. So aircraft registration is becoming a challenge for us. As the representative uh, Beard pointed out, uh, there's a chart in there that shows, the one last chart I'll bring to your attention, uh, showing the aircraft registration in um, Minnesota compared to North Dakota and compared to Iowa. And Iowa stays at $5,000 a year because they charge the 1% just like Minnesota does, but they cap it at $5,000. And so over that seven year period it doesn't decrease at all, whereas in Minnesota it goes from 1% to the quarter percent, but you notice that we're still paying $12,500, which is still over twice as much as it would cost to do it in, in uh, Iowa. And in uh, North Dakota is, is even less yet. And so, um, as, as Representative Beard pointed out, the bill does uh, leave a hole in the state aeronautics fund of about $4 million. We raise $1 million of that by increasing the fuel on business aircraft, and we are looking to transfer uh, sales tax off of aircraft parts and aircraft from the general fund to the state airport fund. And I know that's a challenge in this economic time, uh, but we feel that other surface transportation does get their sales tax money into their mode of operation. And why in 1945 our forefathers did not put the airport fund set up that same way, I do not know. 
We think it's time to correct that, and it'll be a business-friendly uh, opportunity to bring aircraft back to the state of Minnesota. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Hoff, thank you for your testimony. Any questions for Mr. Hoff at this time? You have someone else who would like to testify with you. Could you identify yourself for the record, please? Mr. Chair, Representatives, my name is Michael Lawrence. Uh, I manage uh, Key Air Twin Cities, which is a fixed base operator at the Anoka County Airport in Blaine. Uh, we basically provide services for business, including fuel. And the reason I support this bill is I don't feel that an increase of five cents per gallon on jet fuel for business aircraft would be uh, uncompetitive in the in the fuel uh, provider world. Uh, I feel that we'll still remain competitive. I think this creates a greater opportunity for more aircraft to be based in the state, which at the end of the day would support my business better. We also, uh, the other division of our company is, is aircraft manage, management. Um, we uh, have another facility on the East Coast in, in Oxford, Connecticut. Uh, we considered repositioning some of the aircraft that we manage in Connecticut to Minnesota, but the cost of registering those aircraft here was too cost prohibitive, and uh, we've decided against doing that. So I think there's, there's two ways that, uh, um, that this bill benefits the state. Uh, Mr. Lawrence, uh, thank you for your testimony. A question for you. Um, the average uh, King Air 250, for instance, that leaves the state or that would be based here, uh, what would you estimate a full-time equivalent you would have to hire to maintain and take care of that airplane if it was parked at an Oak County Airport instead of, say, uh, New Richmond, Wisconsin? I would say realistically uh, half of a full-time person per aircraft. Okay. Half? Okay. Uh, I mean, that's it, it it's a, kind of depends on, I mean, if I had... It, it's a growing scale. I mean, one aircraft is, if, if I only had one aircraft, I'd probably have to have three people for it. Okay. But as, as it grows exponentially, it reduces. Thank you. That, and the point to make to the committee is that uh, airplanes based here actually take uh, high-paying, skilled technicians to take care of them. And that's the point I'm trying to make. Mr. Hoff, you had a comment? Uh, I did leave out one portion of the, the bill that uh, would capture fractional ownership. Mm -hmm. That is a business that has boomed over the last 15 years. And those aircraft are op operated out of other states. And the bill would uh, require a Minnesota resident or a Minnesota company to register that portion of the fractional ownership in the state of Minnesota. And we've identified to this date 74 aircraft that are registered uh, by Minnesota companies or residents uh, but are based at another state. And it would deduct the amount they pay in the other state from what they would owe to the state of Minnesota. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Lawrence? Mr. Chair, I, I was just thinking, uh, back to your question, I, I was thinking purely for fueling purposes because that's yeah. what mine thinks about is fueling. But when you add in pilots and mechanics and dispatchers, I mean, you could be into a dozen people per aircraft. That's what I was looking for. Thank Sorry. You. I, I'm, I I'm, do a, have, I'm a fuel-minded Well, thinker. I'll tell you, and I know you are. You, you do a fine job of it there, but I'm familiar. When I first got engaged with this bill about eight years ago, uh, a Gulfstream three that left the state, and there were three full-time equivalents let go at the FBO, two mechanics and a dispatcher that were responsible. That didn't even include the flight crew. That was just the people that kept the plane going. So, uh, members, this is what we're up against here. Uh, further questions for either of these witnesses? And members, while we're thinking of questions, I just want to clarify the fuel tax is to go up a nickel, not a dime. I think I said a dime in my opening remarks. Scheduled for a nickel. And the sales tax, as Mr. Hoff pointed out, the sales tax on aviation equipment in this state, unlike other states, goes to the general fund does not go to the airport fund. Perhaps that's a discussion we'll have another day. Part of this, uh, one of the things the bill does is move $3 million of general fund money to the airport fund to capture some of the value of that uh, back to the uh, source uh, or back to the uh, use for which it was intended. Is there anyone else in the audience who would like to testify for or about this bill? Aeronautics feel compelled to speak to it or General Mills, anybody else? Seeing no one moving this way, further questions from members of the committee before we move this bill to taxes? Representative Biskins. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair. And Mr. Chair, absent a formal fiscal note, can you just let me know if there is a um, net increase or decrease to any fund, be it the general fund or any special revenue fund? Uh, Mr. Representative Biskins, I, um, uh, yes, there will be an increase to the airport fund. Uh, no, the, it will be revenue neutral to the airport fund. It will be a take from the general fund of about $3 million. Members, I do not have a fiscal note with us at this time. Uh, if and when we hear it in taxes, that fiscal note will be uh, made available there. Uh, that, of course, assumes static scoring, that there will not be any increase from airplanes coming back. We don't score that, uh, although there is a case to be made for dynamic scoring that 
actual revenues would go up if this were to pass. But that's another discussion for another day. Seeing no other questions, uh, members, I'll renew my motion that House File 2328 be recommended to pass and refer to the Committee on Taxes. All in favor signify by aye. 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 Opposed? The motion prevails. We're on our way to taxes. Mr. Hoff, thank you. Mr. Lawrence, appreciate your testimony. Thank you. Let's go to Mr. Vogel. Uh, you'll be next with House File 2378. Uh, while we try to round up Mr. Draskowski for his House File. Let's see. And um, Representative Vogel, I believe you have uh, an amendment. I do, Mr. Chair. Uh, Thank uh, I see that the uh, people who do traffic uh, cop work on this are recommending it go to the general register after it's amended. Would you uh, yes. care to move your bill and then move your DE amendment, please? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yes, I move that House File 2378 be um, passed and recommended to go to the general register. Please. Bill's in front of us. Uh, the DE2 amendment now, Mr. Yes, Representative Yes, uh, Mr. Chair. I move the DE2 amendment be uh, be passed and adopted to this bill. Okay, members, the DE2 amendment is moved. Um, it is a substantial amendment. Would you like to uh, pass it to make the bill, or do you need to explain but, it to us? Well, I think if we pass it, just puts the bill in the in the form that it addresses a few of the issues that we had in the last time we heard this last week. That's right. Address Thanks. those issues. So, thank you, members. Yeah. You remember we did have good discussion about this last week. The yeah. DE2 amendment is the result of the author listening to the discussion. Yes. All those in favor of the DE2 amendment signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? The motion prevails. The bill is amended with the DE2 mm -hmm. amendment. Thank you, members. Uh, Representative Vogel. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. Um, what we are looking at here is we did we did take in the uh, the advice on, on some of this uh, that we heard last, last time in committee and uh, correcting some of the uh, date, dates, the effective date, and then um, expiration date stuff as well. Um, if you recall, I think most of you recall that this is on the design build and what we are looking to do is just um, go away from the date specific um, deadline sunset date but uh, go to a project um, number of nine and when the nine projects are completed then we would move ahead on it. Thank you Mr. Chair. Mr. Fisher, do you feel compelled to testify about the bill? You're going to stand for questions if there are any. All right. Yes, Mr. Chair, stand for questions. Good deal. Questions for, uh, about this, Representative Morrow? Well, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Representative Vogel. Re Representative Vogel, I didn't get a chance to ask you before committee, but I note that Representative Hortman is an author on the bill. Have you had a chance to communicate with Representative Hortman about this amendment? I, Representative Vogel? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Representative Morrow, I'm sorry, I did not. I got in late this morning and. Uh, got notified of this change then. Uh, I know it's, uh, you know, Mr. Burris looked at it and, uh, and and basically too with this language we are adopting the, the Senate file uh, changes that they made over there as well to, uh, to address the changes so that we're running in sync with each other and I know Representative Hortman, you know, initially had brought this bill forward um, before and that's why she's on board with it. Thank you. Follow on questions? Uh, so, Representative Vogel, we understand then by adopting the DE2 that this bill uh, lines up then with the Senate file and the work that's been done there? That's correct, Mr. Chair. Good. Thank you. Members, further questions to this bill? Mr. Chair. Uh, Representative Nelson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And, and looking at the amendment, I think that the big change or that I see here is the elimination of this, uh, of this legislative report and the pilot program. You're, um, in the report to the legislature. Do we still have a report to the legislature when these nine projects are done as, as far as how this this goes on or, um, or are we eliminating the report also? Representative Vogel or Ms. Fisher, either one. You got it. You identify yourself for the record and then uh, proceed with your answer. That'd be great. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Chair, members of the committee. My name is Doug Fisher. I'm the Noka County uh, highway engineer and I'm also uh, past president of the Minnesota County Engineers mm -hmm. Association. Um, 
with regards to the reporting again because this legislation is limited to nine projects mm -hmm. we'd actually have to come back to the legislature to be reauthorized uh, to make this uh, uh, continue on beyond the nine projects also the uh, by streamlining this and uh, taking out the uh, uh, council that uh, selects and oversights uh, and puts that responsibility on the Commissioner of uh, the Department of Transportation. There is going to be that ongoing uh, development and process of review uh, with all affected parties, the AGC, the ACEC, and the other uh, entities besides local government in that process. Representative Nelson, follow up. I just thank you, Mr. Chair. I just, I just a report coming back after the nine projects so we can. S to the, I mean, and they're all going to be involved in it, but a report coming back to the committee would be a good idea so that um, I don't know, it would be helpful for us to see if this actually works and does what they intended to do mm -hmm. or whether it was a total failure. And um, having sat on the Sunset Commission this morning, you know, it's, mm -hmm. it's something that going back and looking at is a good thing. But that's just a comment. Okay. Um, wait to amend it. At this time, when it's lined up the Senate file, we'd have to do an amendment on the fly. Um, if it seems like a, an important idea when it gets to the floor, if this comes up there, Representative Nelson, perhaps could you offer that uh, there and we'll uh, work on it at that point? Mm -hmm. Or just a moment. Uh, information is being conveyed to Mr. Vogel, but thank you for your comments. We'll take that under advisement. Yep. Further questions for uh, Representative Morrow? Well, thank you, Mr. Chair. And I, I apologize, Representative mm -hmm. Vogel. Um, I really may have missed this. I'm just comparing the DE2 to the original bill. Uh, I notice on the DE2 lines 1.6, 1.9, eliminate the council. Was the council eliminated in your original bill as well? Representative Vogel? Yes, it was, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Yeah. It was there as well. Yes. Uh, is there anyone else would like to testify for, against, or about this bill? Anyone else would like to testify about this bill? I see no one moving towards the witness stand. Um, Representative Vogel, uh, Pardon me just a moment. Okay, the bill as amended then. If you'd like to renew your motion, uh, that we're going to general register as amended, that would be good. Yes, uh, so move, Mr. Chair, as you said. Further discussion? Seeing none, let's vote. All in favor signify by aye. 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 Opposed? The motion prevails. This bill is on its way to the general, reg general register. Thank you, Representative Vogel. Uh, let's see. Do we have... Uh, Representative Draskowski is here with um, House File 2232 for discussion. Representative Draskowski, welcome to the committee. Um, if someone would move, uh, well, just a moment here till I see which way we're heading. Where is it? Very bad. This committee, this bill will be going to Health and Human Services uh, Finance Committee. Uh, motion, members, uh, Representative Murray, you're moving this one. And so the bill is in front of us, uh, and I believe um, there are a couple of amendments. Representative Drowski, we have 2232 in front of us. I have a delete all, and I have an A3. Are they both yours? They are, Mr. Chair. Okay, let's move the uh, DE1 amendment first. Representative Murray? I believe it's DE1-2, Mr. Chair. DE1-2, please. I would move that, Mr. Chair. Thank you. The DE1-2 is in front of us. Uh, would you just give us a very brief discussion about uh, the DE1-2 and uh, what it does to the bill? Yeah, Mr. Chair, it, uh, it really just uh, refines the approach and the language that's in the... Uh, in the bill to uh, focus on the three areas uh, which are basically taking uh, allowing the Department of Human Services to uh, receive data from um, DVS. Okay. Discussion to that? Members, let's put the bill in the shape the author wishes. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? The DE1-2 amendment is adopted. Now there is an A3 amendment uh, as well. Representative Draskowski, should we move that one also before we discuss the bill then? If you would, Mr. Chair. Mr. Chair. Representative Murray, or uh, Representative uh, Morrow, sorry. <laughs> A temporary upgrade for me. Uh, Mr. <laughs> Chair, uh, given uh, that we just received this amendment at 1029, 
this morning. I'm a little uncomfortable with moving the amendment. Uh, I'd be happy to have Representative Jaskowski or others talk about the amendment, but we haven't had a chance to talk about it. We've got All members right. who would like to run it by. Mm -hmm. uh, so I would ask that we understand the amendment before we move it. Representative Morrow, that's a very reasonable request. Thank you. Um, uh, the, uh, so we have the amendment in front of us. Um, let's discuss that for a moment. Representative Draskowski, can you speak to the A3 amendment or should we have Mr. Burris just, oh, wait, Mr. Burris, you didn't do this one, did you? I'm seeing the initials at the top. Mr. Chair, uh, Ms. Aves, uh, I, I believe, and uh, Ms. Aves was involved with the- She was. The can you, you tell us about the amendment and what it's intended, where it came from? what it's about um, I will mr. chair I've got to pull a copy of the bill out in just a moment it's uh, mr. chair I'd like to talk about the if I could the uh, the bill and the mm -hmm. amendment and the amendment to the amendment collectively if that's okay please yeah proceed and I see you have a, a testifier also from the Department of Human Services perhaps she could shed some light on it as she, well she could certainly help as well Light and, and comfort I think is what we're looking for representative Raskowski okay um, thank you mr. chair and members um, what we what this bill is intended to do and I have met uh, members with the um, with uh, Ms. McCormick uh, from DVS and uh, also with um, uh, Ms. Uh, Vic, Ms. Vic, Vicki Kuhner uh, from the Department of Human Services and Mr. Uh, Kerber also the Officer of the Inspector General from DHS and uh, they are supportive and we have been working on this bill uh, together mm -hmm. and uh, what this does members is uh, accomplishes uh, three things is it allows um, data that the Department of Public Safety's uh, DVS division uh, has acquired in terms of uh, identifying people who have uh, uh, IDs or driver's licenses that are um, uh, that are fraudulent or duplicative. Uh, these are, they have instituted the use over the last year of facial recognition software in the department. They have set aside, and Ms. McCormick will talk, I think it's six or 7,000 records that uh, they have uh, 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 disqualified those uh, identifications for those folks. And uh, what we're gonna do is, has asked the Department of Human Services to review that data and compare that against the 800,000 uh, Minnesotans who are signed up for the variety of welfare programs uh, that we offer in this state and to uh, follow through and, and uh, use their normal due process that they use uh, within their agency, which I understand is very extensive, to uh, remove people who are illegally or improperly signed up for these programs. Uh, DVS also uh, has additional um, and I've got to get the terminology correct, uh, verification of legal presence data that they are able to acquire uh, based on uh, when people who are here temporarily uh, uh, have identified the expiration of their time here. They're able to share that information with DHS and the same thing there, DHS would be able to ensure that those people are removed from our uh, very generous uh, human services programs in Minnesota. And thirdly, uh, there is a piece dealing with uh, convicted drug felons, members we already have in statute. Um, uh, provisions for both MFIP and general assistance that provide that if somebody is a convicted drug felon and they are signed up for either of those programs, there are uh, provisions in law to require varying degrees of drug testing for those folks. Uh, so we would identify convicted drug felons using the data from the courts, allowing DHS to use that data, uh, compare it against uh, the GA and MFIP programs, and then to uh, implement existing law in order to uh, uh, bring them through that uh, those procedures. So, uh, Mr. Chair, members, uh, it might be a proper time up to you, Mr. Chair, but uh, um, the the folks from DHS could uh, be helpful, and I think Miss McCormick may be here as well. She is. Uh, are you Miss Miss Coonerth? Is am I saying your name correctly? Mr. Chair and members, my name is Vicki Coonerth, hmm. and I am the Deputy Inspector General at the Department of Human Services, and I'm responsible for fraud and abuse investigations. Good deal. Uh, if you'd like to testify about the bill, or do you want to, uh, Ms. McCormick to go first? <coughs> McCormick, welcome to the committee. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. For the record, Pat McCormick, the Director of Driver and Vehicle Services. And uh, what this legislation would allow would be for the sharing of data. I know that we have reported to the committee previously that 
We had a, a facial recognition program that was awarded by the Federal Motor Carrier Safety Administration to ensure that um, all drivers, but most especially commercial drivers, we had one driver, one record. And so we, we uh, scrubbed our entire photo database, which we have um, a le over 11 million uh, photos. And of those 11 million photos, um, we have uh, completed the entire scrub, and there were a group of potentially um, fraud, fraud related uh, images that we needed to do further investigation on. And what we do with further investigation is, first of all, we contact those people. Uh, first, we, we run through all the different types of um, issues that would be potentially fraud. Once we've done that, then we notify these individuals and they are allowed to bring forward any documents that they may have that can prove who they say they are because um, it's not always just obvious from photos that it is fraud. And so we, we have completed that first scrub. We have um, identified 7,176 cases where uh, these were required to um, have further interviews with our staff in the first round. We still have 19,000 individuals to, um, to notify and have them come in. We do it on a, um, a phased out basis because of the fact that we only have so many staff that can handle the interviews involved. But we don't believe that um, it will be significantly higher than around 7,700 cases of uh, potential fraud. So what, we've, what we're talking about in this agreement would be that we would, um, once we, we have canceled their license because all drivers are, are given a, a second chance to be able to come in and prove who they say they are. And if they don't come in for the interview, we send out a cancellation notice to them they still have time to come in and see us. And then once that cancellation is effective, then that's what would be the data that would be shared with the Department of uh, Human Services. In addition to that, the uh, legal presence documents, what, what we're talking about in terms of legal presence are those individuals that have a status check on their license. I don't have the actual numbers of those. Uh, the people that needed to run the report weren't, weren't in today. But the status check individuals are individuals that are here on either uh, on a temporary basis, either for uh, a temporary uh, visa for work or for school or whatever. Those people, the law requires that we get an immigration document from them when they come in that allows for however long their, their visa or legal presence is allowed. That's that status check date that's on their driving record. 60 days before that date, we send a, no, a letter notifying them that in order to extend that status check date, they need to come in and provide us with updated Im, uh, documentation from immigration. Most of the time they are able to come in and provide us with that documentation and then we would extend that status check date. If they don't come in after the 60 days, then they, um, they, and they're allowed to bring all sorts of types of documents in or have immigration contact us, but if they don't come in, then we cancel their license. And so if those licenses are canceled, that would be the data that would be sent to um, Department of Human Services for them to do further investigations as to the programs that uh, they're interested in uh, investigating for. Okay, thank you for your testimony. Questions, uh, Representative Gauthier. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Ms. McCormick, you talked about the potential 7,700 potential frauds. Um, my question is, how many of those end up in actual prosecution and conviction of fraud? Um, Ms. McCormick? <clears throat> uh, Mr. Chair and Representative, uh, we don't 
we we are only taking driving privileges away mm -hmm. from those individuals. The department doesn't have authority to prosecute anyone for potential fraud. And so that would have to be done through other sources. Ms. Cooner, you're Inspector General for this. It, it, have we gotten to the point yet where we've identified fraud through this process? Uh, and if we did, could you speak hypothetically about what uh, who would do that? Mr. Chair and members, so far this project hasn't started. Okay. We are so we have not um, gotten the false identifications yet from the Department of Public Safety. Um, we are very pleased with this new resource. We have been notified by the U.S. Attorney's Office and Homeland Security that has told us that it is very common for persons who procures false identifications that they do enroll with multiple IDs in our program. So we expect to find quite a number, but um, we expect to refer, at, we will conduct our own investigations and then after that we will expect to refer the large majority of them to the local county attorney for prosecution. I was just going to mention uh, for the committee's information in the county that I represent, there was one of these uncovered through a medical emergency and found out he had six IDs mm -hmm. and was in multiple uh, benefit scenarios and the problem was when he went into the ER he'd forgotten which name he had gone in before and that's actually how they got him and the county attorney actually prosecuted uh, felony level I believe. Mm -hmm. Representative Gothi, I'm sorry, do you have a follow-up? Yes, thank you Mr. Chair. I'm ju I just want to get this right because th there is a difference between potential fraud and fraud. Um, but what you're telling me is your department has determined that somebody cannot prove who they are, say they are, and you revoke their driving ability. <laughs> Mr. Marmick? Mr. Chair and Representative, yes, that's an authority that we have in the statutes is that we can revoke their driving privileges or their ID card for possible fraud. Okay. We can't do and take any criminal action. Jim got you. Uh -huh. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And maybe to Mr. Burgess, um, I, I don't know where we go from here, but could you please explain the difference between potential fraud and fraud? Uh, Representative, or Mr. Burris, uh, if you care to you try that. that. Um, Mr. Chair, Representative Gauthier, I, I don't think I'm prepared to take a shot at that one. Okay. <laughs> Um, uh, Ms. McCormick, uh, when well, you're preparing the answer, you, you dropped uh, two numbers on us that struck me. One is 7,176 where you had really big questions, and but there was another 19,000 you'd identified. But I think you, first you were going to speak to Representative Gauthier's question <clears throat> about fraud. Thank you, Mr. Chair and Representative. I was looking for the, um, the exact statute so I could read it to you because that explains what what we're able what authority we have and I'll share it with you after the after the hearing um, mm -hmm. the, I'm the reason that uh, we're we have these two numbers is the 7,000 are the ones that we have already canceled the seven but there's an additional 19,000 that are still we still are allowing for them, people to come in and we only send out so many letters at a time because we don't have any additional staff to do this project and so we have to fit it in with all of our other driver compliance related activities and we, we want to make sure that we're allowing the people enough time to be able to present the documents if they have things that they would want to share with us. Thank you. Further questions? Representative Gauthier, follow up? No. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So, Ms. McCormick, you've already determined 7176. You're talking about out of the 19,000, there's probably another 600 or so. So, total, how many notifications did you send out? Uh, Ms. Do you have any idea? Question. <clears throat> Mr. Chair and Representative Gauthier, I, I do have that number, but I don't I can't seem to find it. So Can you give I'll, me a ballpark? I'll provide that to you with a well. All right, what we did is we had 11 million digital images and 1.29 million were flagged, but they were flagged for various reasons. Only 0.5 percent 
of all the uh, potential fraud cases were, were ended up in the cancellation of a license. That's what I wanted to know. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. You're welcome. For, uh, further questions uh, for the testifier, so on? Um, we have in front of us now the amendment, uh, the A3 amendment. Representative Morrow, would you like to chat about that for a minute? Well, I, I would, Mr. Chair, and I appreciate that we took the opportunity to hear the testimony. But Mr. Chair, uh, and I was checking with Mr. Burris, I think the A3 really represents a DE amendment. Members, if you look at the DE 1-2 amendment, page 1 is eliminated under the A3. On page 2, you eliminate lines 2.1 to 213. The A3 eliminates section 4 at the bottom. The A3 eliminates page 3, and it eliminates page 4. So, Mr. Chair, what the A3 amendment does is it, add, it basically only keeps lines 2.14 to 2.25 of the DE amendment. It only keeps what I count to be 11 to 12 lines of this entire four-page amendment, and it adds two pages. So, Mr. Chair, I am going to ask that we have some time to think about this. This is a, a, essentially a DE amendment, and I'd be, you know, I won't speak necessarily for my members on this side of the table, but we're happy to vote on it a Wednesday. But we would like to have a chance to look it over. It really is a DE amendment. Data sharing on the back—that's new, also, isn't it? Um, I know this is going to Health and Human Services next. Is this going to have to go to Civil Law to the Data Committee as well? Who could speak to that? Mr. Mr. Chair. Nicely? Mr. Chair. Uh, Mr. Representative Draskowski. Yes, Mr. Chair. Uh, actually, a similar language has been placed in one of uh, Representative Abler's bills, and it's currently being held heard in Civil Law. It being there, too? Okay. Uh, actually, so. identical language. I'm sorry. Okay. Um, uh, the chair is inclined to say we will vote on this tomorrow evening and move this along. I know we're going to miss, uh, what is today? Monday. I mean Wednesday. Yeah, that's what I mean. Uh, we'll have uh, some more uh, policy bills up on Wednesday in this committee. Uh, in fact, we'll be talking about the um, omnibus bill here shortly. So we can probably move it right along then. We're going to miss one floor day for routing, but I think you'll be just fine. If we can do that. Uh, further comments or our follow-up, Representative Morrow? Well, thank you, Mr. Chair, and I, I appreciate your willingness to do that. Mr. Chair, and maybe this is a question for our staff, should there be a fiscal note at this stage? And I'm wondering, for example, is there a fiscal impact on DPS? I notice uh, monthly reporting. Now, maybe the monthly reporting is gone. Again, I have to go. No, I'm sorry. The monthly reporting is in the A3 amendment. Uh, so I'm wondering if we're going to be receiving a fiscal note that impacts the Public Safety Department that's within our committee's purview. Uh, that is within this committee's purview. Ms. Johnson, are you prepared to speak to that at this moment? Uh, Mr. Chair, uh, it looks like we have a, excuse me, only a preliminary one from DPS, and that was on the original, and so that would not speak to the, the amendments before us. Okay. Um, perhaps. So there would have to be a revised request. Perhaps we can have that revised one when we come back here on Wednesday. I have a hunch since they're doing this work anyhow and in compliance with uh, issue, orders issued by this committee and the work that they're doing that way, which is probably not a very large one, but there may be some impact anyhow. <laughs> uh, further questions or discussions to this? Uh, Ms. McCormick, would you like to respond to that? Well, Mr. Chair, um, not to that particular point, but I did want to clear up the cancellation and I found the statute so that all the members are aware Please. of what our authority is. 171.14, the commissioner may cancel any driver's license upon determination the licensee was not entitled to the issuance of the license. Mm -hmm. The licensee failed to give the required or correct information in an application. The licensee committed any fraud or deceit in making the application. The person at the time of the cancellation would not have been entitled to receive a license under um, our issuance statute. The commissioner shall cancel the driver's license for uh, 60 days or until the required or correct information has been provided, whichever is longer. Thank you for that information. Further discussion uh, to this bill before we lay it over for Wednesday's consideration. Um, anyone else in the audience would like to testify about this bill at this time? We'll bring it back on Wednesday. It'll be a brief uh, bring back. Anyone else want to testify? Seeing no one moving forward, 
Uh, Representative Drzkowski, thank you for your work on this. Ladies, thank you for your testimony. We'll bring this back on Wednesday. Representative Drzkowski, the chair lays uh, the bill over. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members. Representative Nelson, House File 1333. While Representative Nelson is coming, I'll remind the committee and the uh, members in the audience, this bill was actually heard last year and was in uh, what we call Policy Bill Number 1, which was up for consideration last year. Um, there has been a little further work on this bill, and I think, Representative Nelson, you have a DE amendment. Thank if you. you'd like to move 1333, you're going to civil law, you lucky dog. <laughs> so <laughs> well, we'll be happy to don't bet the bill. very often, then, Mr. Chair. <laughs> we'll bet oh. the bill and then send you on your way there, I believe. So, Mr. Chair, I'd like to move the House File 1333 to be passed and moved on to civil law. Okay, the bill is in front of us. And, and then, uh, uh, Mr. Chair, I'd like to move the DE1 amendment. Certainly. Members, the DE1 amendment is in for us. Um, do, can we put the bill in the shape you'd like, or do you that's, need to that's discuss why I move the DE1 amendment. That All right, let's, do, let's put the bill in the shape the author wishes. Members, uh, seeing no compelling questions or comments, uh, all in favor signify by aye. 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 Opposed? The motion prevails. The DE1 amendment is adopted. Representative Nelson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And, as you're, and you're right. We, had, we discussed this last year, and as it moved forward, there were some issues with it. And by mutual agreement from the uh, contractors and the MnDOT, whose bill it is, is that we, uh, they, they decided to pull it out of the, the policy bill to work on those things. And this is the, well, the, the DE1 amendment is the outgrowth of that working on those things. And I have Mr. Raven here from the Department of Transportation to explain the bill or explain it and, and uh, let, let, like to let him to give his testimony. Mr. Raven, welcome to the committee. If you'd identify yourself for the record and then proceed, we'd appreciate it. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair and members. My name is Tom Raven. I'm the state construction engineer for MnDOT. And what I thought I would do here is just kind of refresh your memory of what CMGC is. It's construction manager, general contractor. And then after I do that, I'd briefly go through some of the changes from the bill that you heard last year, some of the agreements that we made with AGC and ACEC and some of our other partners. Um, basically what CMGC is another tool in our toolbox. It's another delivery method for projects at MnDOT. And it, we have design bid build, which, which is the majority of our projects. We also have design build, which we got authority in 2001. We're looking for CMGC is, is basically a hybrid of the two. Um, less risk than a design build, more risk than a design bid build. And what we're really looking to do is just um, uh, take the risk out of these contracts and really just pay for the work that uh, we don't want contractors bidding risk into their project projects because risk, uh, risk equates to money. So we're trying to get a reasonable amount uh, on our contracts and just pay for the work that needs to be done. What, what this process is is basically we would um, either MnDOT would do the design as we typically do or we would hire a consultant. At the same time we would uh, go ahead and, and hire a contractor to help us out uh, basically during the design of the project so that we would get contractor input as far as how would they stage the project, how would they build it, means and methods, and we're really looking for some efficiency or, and these would be done on projects that we don't necessarily have the engineers at MnDOT that have the expertise on these things. So we'd bring them on with their expertise, design a project, and phase two would be a construction contract where we get, once we got to a certain percentage of the design completed, we would attempt to negotiate a contract with that CMGC. And that may be formalized with a gross ma or a guaranteed maximum price or it could be uh, other um, unit items or other, other uh, methods that we, we're looking at. And since, um, since last year, I just want to talk about some of the changes that were made in the bill. We worked with AGC, ACEC, Federal Ohio Administration. We've also consulted with our Department of Administration, who has had this authority for some time. And we believe that we've got a much better bill this year than we had last year. Um, one of the biggest changes was um, it was to the data practices portion of the bill. After the shortlist, and we have the ability to go out and shortlist for uh, shortlist contractors, the, those that are qualified. After we pick that short list, the, uh, so the statement of qualification, the evaluation manual that we use to evaluate those folks, and the, the actual evaluations become public information, and that's consistent with our design build uh, law that was uh, amended here a couple years ago. 
we wanted we want to be consistent in those in those two types uh, also probably the biggest change we made was um, in, in phase two when we go to negotiate the contract with the contractor if we're not able to agree on a price um, previously last year we, the, the, the uh, legislation said they weren't able to bid on the project we've changed that since in the last year and they are now able to bid on the project we think that's a, a, an improvement um, also as a result of that in order to maintain a level playing field for all potential build bidders uh, if the project were design bid build or design build uh, we're required to provide the same information that we provide the CMGC to all potential bidders um, and then uh, we also added a interim report after after five projects that would be due and uh, we actually were uh, we're a total of ten projects now instead of I can't remember what it was last year but after ten projects there would also be a report to the legislation um, and in anticipation of some of the questions you might have, uh, what, what types of project would we use this on? Probably a good example, best example I could think of is a project that we let design build here a couple months ago. And that would be the Maryland Avenue Bridge over 35E. We're using an accelerated bridge technique on that, which uses, uh, basically we're going to build that bridge on site in one of the four quadrants of the ramps there. And we're going to use self-propelled modular transports to move the bridge into place on a weekend. Uh, we've never done that before, and it requires specialized knowledge and engineering and design and that, and then specialized equipment. So uh, if we would have had authority last year to do that, we probably would have pursued CMGC to work with industry to tell us how do we need to design the supports, um, how do we need to design the bridge deck? What's the best way to do this instead of guessing, our engineers guessing how we would do it? And we think we can save some time and some money that way. All, another example might be uh, intelligent work zone systems. Um, those are systems such as travel time on our construction projects. Maybe you've seen uh, some up, up on 35 up towards the loose stop traffic ahead signs or zipper merges. That technology is constantly changing. The data that we use to collect that, that whole technology is changing. We think that would be a great uh, opportunity as well. So with that, I'll just uh, end and, and uh, stand for any questions. Mr. Raven, thank you for your testimony. Are there questions for Mr. Raven at this time? While we're thinking of some things, uh, anyone else in the audience like to testify about this bill? Mr. Werke, I was hoping you'd uh, come down and say a few words. Um, Mr. Work, you welcome to the committee, and you know the drill. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman and committee members. Uh, my name is Tim Workey, represent the Associated General Contractors. A um, couple comments. First of all, AGC of Minnesota supports this legislation as presented. We believe it will provide the department with an appropriate project procurement and delivery model that will be beneficial for both the construction industry and for Minnesota taxpayers. We also applaud the partnership that we have engaged with uh, with MnDOT on this legislation. We believe that that partnering effort has led to the development of better legislation that more clearly defines the roles and responsibilities between the owner and contractor using this project delivery and procurement method. AGC also believes the current legislation provides the necessary transparency and objectivity that our member contractors want to see when making the all-important selection of the CMGC contractor. We also believe the legislation establishes the reasonable limitation on the total number of projects that can be procured under this method and also that it requires a comprehensive evaluation and report back to the legislature before more um, authorization of this usage uh, can be allowed. Contractors have taken a measured and cautious approach to embracing CMGC and we've done this for a variety of reasons. But let me just state two of them. CMGC will require a substantial change to the highway contractor business model. Um, CMGC is most commonly used in the vertical building marketplace, and it's also used most commonly with private owners. It's going to take time and investment for our members in order to, uh, in order to become uh, proficient in this model, um, and that only uh, select few contractors will ultimately be able to participate uh, in CMGC. Um, 
That is because uh, highway contractors are used to the low bid marketplace. They don't um, have the skills uh, and uh, acumen that's necessary or keep those skills on hand uh, within uh, their uh, personnel resources uh, in order to, um, to, to use CMGC in the limited scope that it would be allowed. Um, but our members uh, did want to proceed cautiously and remind uh, this committee and others that uh, low bid is the predominantly um, used uh, procurement model in the marketplace and will likely continue to be so. But I'm proud to stand before the committee today and tell you that AGC supports the legislation. We want to especially thank uh, MnDOT's Office of Innovative Contracting for working with us and being responsive to our concerns. Uh, and uh, Representative Beard and, and others that have been involved in this and Representative Nelson uh, for uh, bringing forward this type of progressive uh, legislation. So thank you. Appreciate your testimony. And I remember last year when we, uh, Representative Nelson and I brought, uh, had talks with you about this that there were some concerns. So those have been worked out. That's uh, good committee work, good work, Representative Nelson. Questions for this witness or for any of the witnesses? Further comments on the bill? <laughs> Members, is there anyone else in the audience that would like to testify about this issue? I see no one approaching the stand. Uh, thank you, Representative Workey, or Mr. Workey, and um, thank you, Mr. Raven. Representative Nelson, would you like to renew your motion, and we'll send you to civil law? I renew my motion that, uh, Mr. Chair, the House File 1333, as amended, be passed and, and moved to uh, civil law. That's the motion. Members, all in favor, signify by aye. 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 Opposed? The motion prevails. You're on your way there. Good luck with that. House file 1901. Representative McFarland. Yes, there you are. <coughs> Members, uh, we'll need to have a motion for House file 1901 to come in front of the committee. Representative Vogel. So moved, Mr. Chair. Thank you. And then uh, um, there is a DE4 amendment. Representative McFarland, I think we should probably adopt the DE4 amendment first, then we'll talk about the bill. Representative Vogel. Mr. Chair, I move the DE amendment be accepted, adopted. Okay. And then whenever we're done and you renew your motion, we're going to Commerce, by the way. That should have been incorporated. Uh, the DE4 amendment is in front of us, members. Let's uh, vote on that. Uh, all in favor signify by aye. 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 Opposed? Motion prevails. The DE4 amendment is adopted. Representative McFarland, to your bill as amended. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. Um, well, you can tell by the number of the delete all amendment number four that we've been through quite a few different versions of this since the original bill came out. I, uh, uh, this was brought to me by um, Ramsey County Attorney John Choi last summer because of the amount of uh, cars that were being towed out of people's yards uh, and being demolished immediately before they could be reported stolen. And so um, the first bill that came out uh, was a little bit more than I had anticipated and I had told the stakeholders that we would meet and try to come to some consensus. Um, it became obvious to me that um, I felt like, you know, I'm in the tire business, I felt like I was on an inner tube and I'd sit on one part and we'd get one part pushed down, another part would pop up and, and that continued on and on. And so uh, after our meeting on February 24th, uh, felt that with many of the stakeholders, we felt that it was clear that we weren't going to have um, real consensus. So we tried to make this bill uh, get to the core of the issue. Uh, we did 901 light, I would call it. And um, so what we did was we tried to address the main issue. And we hope that this um, does not place any unnecessary and erroneous obstacles to anybody in the industry who is legally buying and selling cars for scrap or their parts. Um, the amendment requires that any vehicle purchased without a title may be destroyed, may not be destroyed or dismantled for seven days. That will give law enforcement the opportunity to investigate reports of stolen cars and hopefully get them returned to the rightful owner before the vehicle is destroyed. The amendment does not require the scrap yards physically to hold the vehicle on the property. They can write up a purchase agreement with the seller which contains the information currently required in statutes and then finalize the transaction and take delivery of the vehicle a week later. Um, 
for scrapyards outside the Twin Cities who indicated that they have more, spa have more space to hold vehicles and also buy more vehicles without titles, vehicles that are typically junkers that, will, that have been sitting in fields for years, they can buy the cars without any added paperwork other than what is currently required by law. The amendment also uh, exempts dealer to deal the dealer to dealer and insurance companies to dealers that was in the original bill and there's uh, no additional database to consult, no requirement to be a part of APS and no added security vis video requirements. Mm -hmm. So um, I would, I have a couple testifiers before we have questions if that's okay. Please would uh, welcome testimony. Um, I'd like to introduce um, Ken Reed, Assistant Chief at the St. Paul Police Department. Mr. Reed, welcome to the committee. If you'd identify yourself for the uh, recorded record and proceed with your testimony, that'd be great. Thank you, Mr. Chair. My name is Kenneth Reed. I'm an assistant chief with the St. Paul Police Department on the Major Crimes Division. Please. Proceed. Mr. Chair and members, uh, thank you for allowing me to be here. I'm here today representing the St. Paul Police Department, of course, but also Ramsey County Attorney John Choi, who I had met with this morning. He apologizes for not being able to be here. For a number of years before I was appointed to the uh, assistant chief position, I also ran the department's auto theft unit. And for a number of years, we had uh, reports and complaints of vehicles that were stolen and ultimately ended up in scrapyards. Uh, we faced some difficult investigations because we couldn't always get access to the records that would actually pinpoint where and when they ended up being scrapped. Um, with the advent, in fact, uh, I authored a letter to scrap metal dealers in St. Paul that asked them to be mindful of the rules and the statutes that they operate in under, including ISRI's voluntary provisions. But we kept having, kept running into these type of complaints and suspicions. Last summer, the St. Paul Police Department Auto Theft Unit uncovered nearly a dozen illegal tow truck drivers who were stealing cars and scrapping them for cash at Twin City Scrap Metal Operations. Investigators determined that there were three schemes involved. The first scheme involved thieves who used spotters to identify vehicles to steal. These individuals then called tow truck drivers and sold them, ostensibly sold them, the stolen vehicles, which were then towed away and towed to the scrap metal processors. The second scheme involved tow drivers who themselves stole vehicles and sold them to the scrap metal processors. And the third scheme more directly involved the theft of vehicles by individuals who drove, drove them themselves to the automobile metal recyclers and sold them for scrap. In some cases, the vehicles had been scrapped within hours of being stolen. We worked in partnership with a number of entities on these investigations and on subsequent ways to address the issues presented, including the Ramsey and Hennepin County's attorney's offices, the St. Paul City Attorney's Office, the Ramsey County Sheriff's Department, St. Paul and Minneapolis Police Departments, City of St. Paul, Ramsey County, and the Minnesota County Attorney's Association, Minnesota Sheriff's Association, and the Minnesota Chiefs of Police, and also the National Insurance Crime Bureau and the Minnesota Insurance Federation. The investigation and prosecution of these and other individuals involved in the scrapping of stolen motor vehicles continues today. To date, there are 17 defendants and over 86 stolen motor vehicles involved. For St. Paul, our auto theft rate at the end of 2011 dropped nearly 10% during the course of this investigation, which represents nearly 200 vehicles. HF 1901, in the opinion of the St. Paul Police Department and of, assist, uh, and of uh, Ramsey County Attorney John Choi, certainly qualifies and makes some affirmative steps in the right direction by requiring a certificate of title or salvage title matching the vehicle's vehicle identification number and any applicable lien releases. A copy of the seller's proof of identification and a statement signed by the seller under penalty of perjury attesting that the motor vehicle is not a stolen vehicle and is free of any liens or encumbrances and that the seller has the right to sell the motor vehicle are very important to us. The no documentation required, retention periods, and inspection capabilities are all important advances in protecting the consumer's interest. From that standpoint, we are supportive of this. I would like to thank Representative McFarland and all the people who worked on HF 1901 for their time and effort in helping to address what has been to us a significant problem. 
Thank you for your testimony. Representative McFarland, you have another testifier there? Mr. Markle is here. He's been anxious to tell you his story. Mr. Markle? <laughs> <laughs> the testimony, what we do is we identify ourselves for the recorded record, who you are, where you're from, and then proceed with your testimony. I've been here before. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chair. David Markle, uh, Minneapolis. On last May, beginning of last May, I arrived on foot at my workshop in St. Paul, having walked there from Minneapolis, and I discovered that my, uh, my best vehicle was missing. There were subtle indications that it had been towed. This is from private property. I... Uh, notified my neighbors of well, first I, no I called the police the police came promptly I made a report notified my neighbors next door was inside calling trying to borrow a car and while I was doing that the thief came back and with a tow truck and tried to steal my other car I didn't hear them uh, the neighbors heard something went out and essentially scared the, the thief away well, I didn't know, of course, what had actually happened to my car. I thought perhaps it had been stolen for parts. But um, uh, a friend of mine who's in the salvage business himself, miscellaneous salvage, told me you'd better start calling these salvage yards. So within a day or so, I started calling yards, Metro Metals, Great Western, Alter, parts places like uh, Pull Your Own Parts. Uh, none of them had any information on my car. I was brushed off by Metro Metals, basically, who said, well, once in a while we help, you know, catch a thief, but not usually, basically, is what they said. Mm -hmm. Well, then uh, some time went by, and the St. Paul uh, Police and, and Ramsey County Attorney's Office notified me that uh, an investigation had taken place, and the thief who had stolen my car had been caught and that it had been taken to Metro Metals and uh, crushed very rapidly. And so I, um, I started looking at um, the possibility of going into civil court and got a hold of some, a number of the um, complaints and statements of probable cause. I have a database, this is part of it, for uh, just some of those. And it was interesting to find out that um, State law and regulations require these yards to report their intake to the state registrar, but not one of these vehicles had been reported. Uh, the DVM uh, and, or DVS doesn't have any enforcement power, of course. Um, I, I could go on for an hour about this problem, but... Um, oh, you don't want to do that. No, you're right. <laughs> the attorney for the for the yard that crushed my car, which is probably the biggest time uh, crusher of stolen cars, probably still uh, crushed hundreds and hundreds of them. I have a, a police report from Minneapolis from uh, 2008, which mentions uh, 19 stolen Subaru is showing up at that yard. I particularly appreciate, by the way, the St. Paul police investigation of this. They did a wonderful job. I think the Minneapolis police are overburdened with murder cases and so on. But the attorney for Metro Metals has said that the, the, their company follows all laws and regulations for its industry. Well, obviously they don't because they don't report to the registrar. And they say that a large percentage of those vehicles have no titles or lost titles and the auto salvage industry would come to a standstill if titles were required. Well, I really don't think that's true. Uh, I, I can't imagine that the industry is dependent on stolen vehicles to that extent. Now, I, I, I support this bill strongly. I think it's a step forward. I do think that next year we'll be back, somebody will be back here asking that the uh, automated property reporting system be included as it is with pawn shops because I think that a lot of these thieves are not going to shrink at committing perjury. And I don't think the yards, such as Metro, will shrink at continuing to crush the cars as rapidly as they can. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Are there quick questions for either of these testifiers? Because I have a few other people need to talk about this issue. Uh, thank you. If you'd stand by, that would be great. Um, I also have uh, Mr. Cassidy and uh, Mr. White, Tony White. Uh, Mr. Cassidy, Mr. White, and I also have uh, Eva Shire. Are you uh, in this group also, Ms. Shire? Or Shine. Shine, okay. 
Yes, please. Kind of queue up behind Mr. Cassidy there. That'd be great. And uh, Mr. Cassidy, welcome to the committee. If you'd uh, proceed with your testimony, that'd be great. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Paul Cassidy with the law firm of Leonard Street and Dinard. I'm here uh, today on behalf of the uh, Minnesota chapter of the Institute of Scrap Recycling Industries, which represents dozens of uh, scrap recyclers in the state of Minnesota. I want to thank Representative McFarland for attempting to work with us on this bill. Unfortunately, today we're going to have to oppose uh, the bill as it is now written. Uh, first and foremost, we think that uh, uh, this proposal from day one has been unworkable and unnecessary. Unnecessary for all the reasons that some of the previous testifiers alluded to, and that is a auto theft ring was operating in the city of, city of St. Paul. Uh, the police identified that it was operating as such. There were uh, individuals were uh, auto car thieves that were working with, with tow trucks that were unmarked, and they obviously were working with a scrapyard rogue employee that probably was taken in cars under the cover of night from our understanding of the situation. Um, criminals are being prosecuted and the law works and I think that's what's been going on. We've identified a problem and these individuals are being uh, properly prosecuted. We understand the problem. Law enforcement needs better information and they need it quicker and we're willing to work with them to do that. Um, but this proposal uh, doesn't get to that point. We think that if uh, we were able to work with uh, law enforcement to have uh, a more efficient, quicker reporting of, of auto titling data and vehicle <coughs> identification number data, that we can get to the root of the problem and law enforcement and prosecutors would have the information that they need. Um, this bill doesn't do any of that right now. Right now, this bill really um, shines a light on, our, on all of our customers and requires them to sign a statement that they haven't stolen the auto. Number two, it requires that we report yet again to another law enforcement ag agency, local law enforcement, um, uh, whereby right now we already have to report to the Department of Public Safety and to the, uh, the National uh, Vehicle Title Information System. We should make those two processes better before we add yet another third layer of regulation and mandates on these businesses. And third, the proposal requires us to hold uh, untitled cars for up to seven days. If any of you were to visit uh, a scrapyard today uh, in the metro area or out state, these are not large places. These are places that work in the commodity business and they do not have the room uh, nor can they afford to store these cars. The cars come in, they're processed properly, the information that's required under current law is taken down and uh, the cars are shipped out. Right now, uh, five years ago on a bill that I worked on along with, with my colleagues from ISRI, uh, we passed a law in 2007 uh, putting new regulations on scrap metal processors. Those laws aren't being properly enforced. That law already has in it a, a provision that allows law enforcement to hold any, anything they would like with probable cause. They should use that. Second, I'd like to point out that uh, we have tried to offer up some solutions and I'd like to offer them up today. Number one is that we think there can be a better reporting system. There should be a faster, more efficient reporting system. We would like to work with law enforcement on that. Number two, we think that there is terrible two-way communication between the law enforcement community and our industry. Um, we have a reporting system that we use that we try to put law enforcement on alert with. Um, we think that they should use that uh, more into better use to, to highlight items that they identify in the streets that have been stolen. We can do that with automobiles as well. When a car is stolen, we should create a centralized uh, uh, database or reporting system on the, on the web that scrap recyclers can go to and look for the VIN numbers of automobiles that have been stolen. That is a readily, uh, uh, ready and available way to identify those cars immediately. With that, Mr. Chairman, I'll conclude my testimony. I would like to uh, ask a couple of our members to come up and uh, uh, talk a little bit about uh, kind of the mechanics of their industry on a day-to-day -day basis and seven-day hold period. And with that, we'll um, ask, uh, be stand for questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Cassidy. Uh, when they're coming, I just have uh, one question for you. I, thinking back to a, a former employee I had in my previous life whose car was stolen, and he didn't even know it was stolen for 48 hours because he had been working came home on the bus, he hadn't driven his car that day, and when he got up the uh, following morning found his car gone and another car that had been stolen in his place. Um, uh, the the um, hold time thing, I mean a car could be uh, yanked and shredded before a, a citizen even knows their car is gone. Uh, that concerns the chair a bit. Think about how we might address that if you would. And if you have a couple of quick testifiers, we have another 10 minutes and we're not going to get to the last bill on the agenda, but we'll talk about that members in a moment. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. So let's have um, Ms. Shine or Mr. White.
Mr. White, welcome to the committee. If you'd identify yourself for the record and testify, that'd be great. Good afternoon, uh, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. My name is Anthony White with Northern Metal Recycling. Okay. I work for a company based out of St. Paul. We actually have nine locations in the state of Minnesota, 13 throughout uh, North Dakota and Wisconsin all together. On a daily operation, we're processing all sorts of scrap metal, anywhere from car bodies to uh, residential uh, cleanups, household cleanups to farmsteads to industrial scrap. Um, one thing we do process is cars from the public, from, from individuals, from companies on a daily basis in St. Paul where I, uh, where I uh, station. We uh, do anywhere up to 130 cars a day um, over the summer periods and the winter. Obviously, it, it slows down. Uh, it's all based on market conditions processing. Uh, that scrap on a daily basis to uh, reflect the market conditions, just like the stock market is traded uh, typically uh, monthly, sometimes daily, sometimes hourly. Um, daily transactions include um, identification of the individual, check being cut, uh, video surveillance, proper record keeping, all, uh, all kept together for uh, possible investigations to help uh, the police departments, the sheriff's associations prosecute uh, the gentleman or the individual that uh, that has stolen, if if he has stolen any property. Um, reporting as far as uh, what we do, we also report to NIMVITAS, which is the, the federal system. As far as the VIN number, tie that to the gentleman's name or the individual's name who brings in the property of a car uh, for further prosecution if there is, if it is stolen. Uh, also, we do a double reporting to the DPS as well. Um, which that information should be available. I believe uh, in our meetings um, the other day, uh, we talked about, I believe that information is available within 24 hours after being reporting uh, or reported. Um, as far as our outlying yards, we've had um, companies in Wilmer, Glenwood, St. Cloud, outside the metro um, that do take in quite a few cars that do not have titles or older, older model vehicles, uh, especially farmsteads or groves where a farmer or an individual would like to do a big cleanup because he know the market's in good condition. He's going to get proper value or full value of what he's getting. As far as a, a hold time, would definitely uh, deter anybody from, uh, from recycling at the, at the moment. If there is a seven-day seven wait, depending on market conditions going from month to month, uh, there has been swings of hundreds of dollars. Uh, you know, farmers aren't going to aren't going to let their cars just sit there for that time period. Also, we also compete with um, scrap companies throughout Minnesota, also in the North Dakotas, Iowa, also in Canada that have mobile uh, recycling equipment for these cars that'll go into uh, to farmsteads and clean them out and and bring them out of state. As far as logging them into uh, portable um, car hulks, taking them out of state for processing, and they don't have to follow the the seven day holding period. Um, you know, on a daily basis through all our companies in the state of Minnesota, uh, I believe we're roughly doing about 150 to almost 200 cars in the summer a day uh, at the high points. Obviously, that's a high number in the winter, maybe 30, 40. Uh, things that we struggle with is uh, environmental issues as far as cars that are sitting on a lot uh, too long, also space and storage. Uh, we definitely have a limited uh, space structure. A lot of the scrap companies that I represent and uh, that I've worked for have limited space for these, these products. Um, EPA issues uh, were regulated in certain areas of our, of our facility to store these. And like I, I mentioned before, we're, we're structured around a market-based commodity. A car is a market, uh, marketable commodity. Uh, a hold period just deters the, the value and potential loss on that investment. <coughs> That'd be it. Sir. Thank you. Uh, Re uh, Representative Marlon. Could I ask a question of the witness? <laughs> 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 If you ask it of the chair, maybe I can ask it of him. So. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, <laughs> what percentage of vehicles that you take in do not have titles? Did you get the question there? I did, okay. Mr. Chairman. Uh, I work for the St. Paul um, Division of Northern Metal Recycling. Yes. Uh, we actually require a title um, at that particular location. At our Glenwood and Wilmer locations, we do not require a title. Um, just due to the fact that the older model vehicles there are typically the, the cars in the groves that, that we do report the VIN number to DPS and Invitus. And thank you for your testimony. And I'm thinking um, uh, if somebody brings a 1956 DeSoto to one of your rural sites, I'm sure that that might not get crushed. It might be sold otherwise, huh? I, w I would think so. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Representative uh, um, Murray. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, 
to the testifier, you mentioned uh, that you gave the VIN number to, I'm assuming this is the National Motor Vehicle Title Information System, to match up with the ownership names. Can you tell me about that process and why, if, if a person brings in a car and it doesn't match up, what do you do? Mr. White. Um, Mr. Chairman and uh, member of the committee. Um, the, the information that goes to NIMVITAS, which is the National Motor Vehicle Title Information System, which has been adopted by the, the federal government, as far as the stationary uh, standardized uh, uh, scenario where you match up the VIN number with the person that brings the vehicle and not necessarily the, the title holder, but it matches that name um, with that VIN number in case somebody wanted to access the NIMVITAS, which is open record for law enforcement for anybody to view, to go in and, and, and inform or inquire about an investigation over a car. So it, it centralizes that information. If a police department did want to investigate into a certain VIN number of a car, they could go to the system and see who brought it in, if it went to a recycling company or an auto parts dealer or um, anybody that's buying a used car. Okay. Just Mr. Quick. Murray? So in other words, you record that, but you still crush that car, and that's just for backup later. Yeah, right. correct. That's to, um, to get the information out there. Um, so if there was a case, if it happened to be a stolen car or whatever the case may be, it would tie that, that individual to that VIN number so that you could prosecute against that. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, Ms. Um, Shine, uh, do you have some remarks for us, please? If you Mr. Chairman, yourself, proceed. That'd be great. My name is Eva Shine. I'm with Shine Brothers Corporation of Minnesota in Worthington, Minnesota. Worthington, did you say? Correct. Thank you. We have approximately 13 employees in Worthington. Um, the, the hold period, as Mr. White indicated, is very problematic for our industry. Um, even in the rural areas, we're operating on very limited space. The vehicles that come into a scrap facility typically are very low value. Vehicles, items may have been removed by the time they get to our facility, like the, uh, if there's aluminum wheels on the vehicle, they're most likely removed. Uh, catalytic converters, most likely removed. Um, certain facilities within Minnesota require that uh, gas tanks and fluids be drained at that point. So the vehicles that come into our facilities are typically low value. Um, and also when we process them, they may arrive on a trailer or whatnot. They're unloaded with heavy machinery because of the um, volumes of material that we handle. They're not gently handled and because of their, their low value. So we, they might be taken off with a forklift and the fork may stab a hole in the vehicle at that time. So the hold period is problematic because um, the vehicle might not be able to be returned. You know, if, if a stolen vehicle was purchased, it might not be able to be returned in the same condition as it was brought in or as when it left the original location. Thank you for your comments. Uh, questions for the testifier, for either? Um, I, Mr. Chair, I do have one other testifier. Uh, Representative McFarland, it is Ms. Uh, Ms. Nancy, my Ms. Haas, come on down. Yes. Welcome to the committee. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Members, my name is Nancy Haas with Messerly and Kramer here today on behalf of the Minnesota County Attorneys Association. I just wanted to put on the record we're um, very thankful for Representative McFarland for carrying this bill. Our association, the Minnesota County Attorneys Association, did support the more comprehensive proposal before the delete all amendment, but we um, recognize the need to take a baby step today, and so we are supportive um, specifically of the um, requiring the title. And so we, I just wanted to be on record supporting uh, the bill today. Uh, thank you for your testimony. Questions for Ms. Haas? Uh, members, um, is there anyone else in the audience who would like to testify for or about this bill? Uh, oh, please, uh, if you'd come forward and identify yourself. So you're hiding back there in the dark and the chair has trouble seeing past the Klieg lights to see who's back there. Welcome to the committee. Please identify yourself. Please proceed with your testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. My name is Jorge Conforme and I'm with LKQ Corporation. LKQ Corporation is the nation's largest distributor of aftermarket and recycled auto parts. And I would like to first of all thank you for allowing me to speak a couple minutes and I'd like to thank the rest of the members in the committee and especially Representative McFarland 
for having worked with us uh, this past month or so on um, House File 1901. Mm -hmm. um, I, don't, I also appreciate the fact that she's been very, very open to making this bill good on everyone. Um, at this time, however, we are concerned still with uh, certain provisions of the amended bill, specifically as to the definitions of a scrap, scrap vehicle and a scrap vehicle dealer. I'm also I'm not speaking on behalf of the Minnesota Automotive Recyclers, but we have worked with them, and I have discussed this amendment with them, and we have worked with Representative McFarlane on this bill. And um, unfortunately, they cannot be here today, but we remain concerned in the fact that the definition of a scrap vehicle includes vehicles that are acquired for dismantling and sale of parts. The current Minnesota statutes define a vehicle that is acquired for dismantling of its parts and sale of its parts and requires those who do that to acquire a used parts dealer's license. Under this language, we would, be quite, we would be required, automotive recyclers would be required to acquire a scrap vehicle dealer or would be considered a scrap vehicle dealer. We are concerned with double reporting requirements. We are concerned with the fact that the scrap metal that we uh, uh, create it's the last part of our processes when we're recycling parts. We just acquire junk vehicles, dismantle them, acquire their parts, <coughs> put them out for sale, and then the last part, of, the last phase of our processes is selling the whatever's left of that vehicle to scrap metal processors. So under that logic, we do not consider ourselves scrap metal processors or scrap metal dealers. That is our concern with this bill. We are concerned, again, once again, with any proximity to new requ uh, reporting requirements. Automotive recyclers currently do report to the Minnesota database and we do report to NIMVITAS as well. And I can speak for LKQ when I tell you members that LKQ does not acquire vehicles without a title. So with that said, we would like to, um, I would like to thank you and um, thank you for your time. Oh, to be clear then, Mr. Conforme, if you require a title, then the bill would not apply to your company, as I understand, correct? Yes, we understand. But, but yes, thank you. Okay. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> okay, well, this is uh, obviously um, you're attempting to do good work. We certainly understand the issue. Um, uh, further members, uh, questions uh, to the uh, either of the testifiers or to the author? Anyone else would like to testify about this bill? And we are now over time, so I'm going to just allow another moment. You would like to testify, sir? Please come down and make it uh, concise to the point. And then we're going to ask Representative Vogel. Mr. Chairman, to his and I was assembled. Uh, my name is Mark Leader, Leader Brothers Company. I'm a scrap seller here in the Twin Cities. Okay. Um, I guess what I'd like to say is uh, with this last gentleman here, um, I think there's little understanding of our industry. There's a lot of overlap. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the problems of the uh, communication that we've had in our previous meetings with uh, Mr. Choi's office and perhaps the representative. I, hadn't, I wasn't able to attend your meeting. Um, I think what we eventually need to get to is a very simple, a non-redundant type of a bill, something with clear language. And we've invited uh, the people who have tried to create the language of this bill to visit our facilities and understand our facilities. Uh, we've yet to have that happen. Uh, I think there is, like I say, overlap with the, the last gentleman's type of industry and mine. In our industry or mine, or the cars come in at the end of their life, um, is a whole different thing than a lot of people understand. We have the space issues, uh, we have the value issues of the commodities, and um, I think that there needs to be a greater bit of communication and actual um, understanding of some of the legislators coming out and seeing our facilities. And I thank you and the assembled people here for hearing us and, and the arguments. Thank you. Questions to the uh, witness, to the author? Anyone else want to testify for or about this bill? Members, um, uh, this is going to Commerce Committee and I think a few other stops before it, it hits the floor. Uh, there's some work to be done yet, but we understand the urgency and uh, thank you for your accommodation, Representative McFarland, to this point. Representative Vogel renews his motion that House File um, 1901, as amended, 
direct men to pass to the Commerce Committee for further deliberation. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? The motion prevails. Aye. The motion is on its way to Commerce. Thank you, and uh, Representative McFarland, we look forward to talking to you a little further about this and reaching some further accommodation. Thank you. Members, um, the last bill on the calendar of the uh, agenda for the day is the delete all amendment. You have copies of that. If you, um, you would just uh, hold on to those notes and put them back in your uh, today file. We won't have to kill any more trees to reproduce this for Wednesday. I'm not going to ask the committee to come back tonight and talk about this. Everything in the bill has been discussed at one point or another. We'll bring it up and have a good vigorous debate on Wednesday and talk about House file uh, 2685, the DE1 amendment, which you have. That will be the basis for our omnibus bill number two going forward. Uh, members, I think that's all we have to come for, so I will declare us adjourned. <laughs>